Church, shall we dance? We shall. Hi, I'm Pastor Mike of Namioka United Methodist Church. Every Sunday we have two morning worship services at Namioki. The first begins at 8.15am. It's a laid back traditional service. And the second service begins at 10.30am. It's a blended family friendly service for people of all ages. We'd love to see you this coming Sunday, 1900 Pontoon Road in Granite City, Illinois. Just minutes away from the mighty Mississippi River and the heart of the city of St. Louis.
I've traveled through the Middle East. I've got to walk the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem. Uh, I've been to, uh, hmm. no, New Zealand doesn't count as a country, does it? I've been to New Zealand, of course, all across Australia, through Asia and other places as well. I've been really fortunate to be able to see a lot of the world. But here's an interesting fact about me that you might not believe. Even though I've flown everywhere across the world, I'm afraid of flying. I don't like flying. It's like you cram a couple of hundred people into a metal cylinder and shoot it through the atmosphere at some 900 miles an hour. Everyone is sick with something, and you know when you get off a 14-hour flight, you're going to be sick with whatever everybody else had on the plane. The food is terrible. I don't like flying. Actually, I'm afraid of heights. That's why when we put in the projector uh, last year, I didn't get up there. I made Don and Dan get up there. I ain't getting up there for no one's business. <laughs> now, over the time that I've been flying all over the world, it has gotten better as time has gone on. But I, I still have a healthy fear of flying. Still on a long-haul flight, I'll ask for an aisle seat because I don't want to look out that window. I know that if I pull the shade up at the window and look out for more than just a couple of moments, I'm going to feel sick to the pit of my stomach. The idea of being a pilot in the cockpit terrifies me. I do not want to know what the pilots see out in the big blue beyond as they navigate that plane. So one of those important birthday milestones rolled around for me as someone that uh, I thought knew me gave me as a gift flying lessons. Needless to say, that voucher never got used and expired <laughs> because there was no way I was getting in a little plane to certain death. 
So utilizing the power of crowdsourcing for sermon illustrations, I asked the question on Facebook, and some of you responded, by the way, uh, a couple of weeks ago, what's the worst gift you ever received? And boy, did I get some interesting responses, both publicly and privately. To a fellow United Methodist clergyman, one who is a teetotaler, he received from one of his congregation members one Christmas a fifth of Jack Daniel's finest. <laughs> to a new bride from her new mother-in-law, a set of scales. Not kitchen scales, bathroom scales. Nothing says welcome to the family more than a slam against your weight. <laughs> Someone wrote about receiving a dog collar. Not one of these things here, but actually a collar that goes on a dog. Someone wrote about receiving a dog collar from a family member for Christmas. Problem was, she owned a cat. Another United Methodist clergy colleague told me of receiving a jar of homemade canned tomatoes. Hey, if anyone ever wants to give me a jar of homemade canned tomatoes, rock on. And she gratefully received it and thought it was a wonderful gift until the lady who gave her the canned tomatoes was caught stealing other people's tomatoes from their gardens. <laughs> Someone, I can't quite remember who within our congregation, told me about receiving a yellow crocheted pig designed to fit over a roll of toilet paper. Someone else talked about receiving from their mother-in-law, again, we've got mother-in-law jokes coming through this morning. Someone talked about receiving a can of Pledge dusting spray when her house was rather dusty. Someone talked about a family member giving them a stick of deodorant. And another person talked about being given a trailer load of cow manure. Now you might think that is the worst gift you can ever give, but I've got to say for the person who received it, they thought it was the best gift ever because they were a gardener and they wanted that cow manure for their garden. Do not give me a trailer load of cow manure. But there were two gifts that were listed by congregation members here at Namiyoki that kind of tied for first place, at least in my book. Now, Kevin Wozniak reported about not so much receiving a gift, but having to actually buy his own birthday cake one, one year. <laughs> but apparently, mummy dearest and wife dearest forgot. For shame. <laughs> of course he didn't tell the whole story, that's the beauty of it. And Jennifer, our organist, talked about the year that her husband, Mike, gave her a toilet. And if you excuse my pun, gifts don't get any crappier than that one. <laughs> it was professionally installed. It professionally installed, <laughs> wonderful. Now, I received an unexpected gift in the mail this week. I came in on Tuesday morning and Linda handed me an envelope and she said, there's something strange in this envelope. Now the envelope was from Darla McFadden, the young lady that will be here, young lady, she's a year older than I am, uh, the lady that will be here next week singing for us. Now, I thought, well, what, whatever strange thing could be in there? So I took the envelope into my office and emptied the contents onto my desk. There was a letter. There was an artist contract for us to sign that says, yes, we'll host her. There were several posters in the package, and you'll see those posters up around the church this morning. And then there were her 17-year-old daughter's dental records. <laughs> so I can tell you from looking at Dala's daughter's dental records this week that she has a fine set of teeth and a strong jawline, uh, that she had the impacted wisdom teeth there as well, and uh, I've been told since they've been taken out, and Dala will um, collect her daughter's dental records next Sunday. <laughs> you know, sometimes God gets a bad rap when it comes to Christians and others trying to make sense of life lived in a broken world. Now the Bible tells us that God gives the sun to warm and the rain to nourish everyone regardless. The good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. And there are some Christians that believe that God is like a great puppet master, sitting up in the sky, pulling strings. He might pull the string of a flood one day, he might pull the string of a fire the next, he might pull the string for something good one day. But some people believe that God is up there in heaven, causing disasters and wonderful things to happen all at the same time. 
a pastor and the head of a national religious organization in the United States called the Family Research Council. They're an extreme right-wing religious conservative group. Agreed in an interview last year that he conducted that Isaiah chapter 9, verse 10, was a prophecy about the United States that will take effect when President Obama leaves office next year. So what does Isaiah 9, verse 10 say? Here's what it says. The brick buildings have fallen down, but we will replace them with stone buildings. The beams of sycamore wood have been cut down, but we will replace them with the finest cedar. I guess you can kind of see where his brain is going with that, right? There's a problem. This particular religious figurehead believes this verse is a prophecy about rebuilding a nation after it's been destroyed. But it isn't. You know my favorite word, context. Context, context. When you read this scripture in context, this particular verse is what the proud and the arrogant speak in the face of God when they don't want God involved in their lives anymore. Hang on. The brick buildings have fallen down. We'll replace them with stone buildings. The beam of sycamore wood have been cut down, but we will replace them with the finest cedar. The very next verse talks about the punishment that God will deal out on those people who replace the brick buildings with stone buildings and the sycamore wood buildings with cedar buildings. He and I have a problem. Strike one on believing that this is a prophecy. It is not. Later in this same interview, this same religious figure concurred that concurred with a statement that God last year, in 2015, sent Hurricane Joaquin as punishment on America because of society's changing views on the legality of same-sex marriage. Now, I've got a problem with a guy who claims such things, especially when Hurricane Joaquin last year did not hit the United States. It devastated parts of the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, Bermuda, Cuba, Haiti, and the Iberian Peninsula. A tropical storm alongside it did dump a lot of rain in South Carolina, but it wasn't the hurricane, it was a separate storm. So yeah, let's agree with him, shall we? God punished the United States of America because of gay marriage by killing people in the Caribbean, by flooding villages filled with poor people who lost everything they owned, by cutting off the power to tens of thousands of residents, by washing out roadways, destroying seawalls, and sinking fishing vessels. Now, God, if you're listening, and if you indeed sent Hurricane Joaquin to the Caribbean because you wanted to punish the United States of America, I want to go on record this morning as saying, God, you need an appointment at Lenscrafters. Because your prescription doesn't work anymore. By the way, anyone, and I mean anyone who believes that God sends natural disasters upon the nations as punishment for this sin or that sin or some other sin that they've made up, has perverted the gospel to the point that it is no longer the gospel. It's no longer the good news, it's the bad and very awful news. Now this particular religious figure lives near Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Guess what happened 10 days ago at his house? 10 feet of water destroyed it. So if God sent punishment as a hurricane on the Caribbean last September because of a Supreme Court decision in the United States, the question needs to be asked, what in the world did this guy do wrong? Sometimes we blame things for things God simply doesn't do. Sometimes we interpret bad gifts in our life, the gifts of flood and fire and trial and temptation, cancer, Alzheimer's, as God's way of punishing us for some unseen sin. Some uncovered, some covered up secret kind of sin that we keep hidden from everybody else. Now from time to time, and I've been guilty of this too, from time to time you may have thought in a particularly difficult part of your life, well gee God, why are you picking on me this way? But out of the same mouth, we'll also give God thanks for other strange things, like our material blessings. Thank you, God, I have a car. Thank you, God, I paid off my mortgage. Thank you, God, that I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts, if you indeed know that song from many years ago. Does God send us his 
children, natural disasters and financial ruin, sexual abuse, domestic violence, murder, child trafficking, broken relationships and a dead car battery on that very morning you have that important appointment to get to? I'm not sure that God pulling strings to make your life a misery is good theology. They say that everything happens for a reason. I actually agree with that statement. Sometimes the reason is you built your house on a floodplain. Sometimes the reason is someone got angry and hurt you. Sometimes the reason is you don't look after your car very well. When the earth was destroyed in ancient times by a flood, a flood that covered the whole planet, God said to Noah after the ark had birthed, I am now making my covenant with you and with your descendants and with all living beings, all birds and all animals, everything that came out of the boat with you. With these words, I make my covenant with you. I promise that never again will all living beings be destroyed by a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Now, this doesn't mean that a broken earth doesn't experience the pain of its own brokenness. But it does mean that God is out of the disaster business. What kind of God would give his children a stone when they asked for bread? What kind of God would give his daughters and sons a snake when they asked for fish? As bad as you think you might be, the scripture says, you still know how to give good things to your children. How much more then will God give good things to his own, to those who ask? We often measure God and success, sorry, we often measure success in the kingdom of God by numbers. How many people are coming to church? How much money was in last week's offering? How financially solvent are we? Can we pay the salaries of the church staff and the light bill and the insurance and give to missions and whatever else we need to do this week? Thankfully, that's not a big issue here at Namioki at the moment. But those of you that have been in the pews for a while know that once it was. Now, these kind of metrics are important, but they are not, at least as I understand it, the same metrics that God uses to discern whether a congregation is healthy or not. When the prophet Samuel was sent to Jesse's house in order to anoint one of Jesse's sons as the kingly successor to Saul, Jesse paraded his most handsome and winsome sons before the prophet. The first son was Eliab, quite a handsome and strong man. He must have been because Samuel records himself as thinking, this has got to be the guy. And God says, nope. Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord... <coughs> looks at the heart. And so came the next son, and the next son, and the son after that, and the son after that, and the Lord keeps tapping Samuel on the shoulder. Nope, not that one. Uh-uh, absolutely not. Are you kidding me? No. And then there are no sons left. And the prophet inquires of Jesse, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, well, there's, there's one, but he's the youngest. What would you want with him? He's out looking after the sheep. But they fetch the son looking after the sheep. And as that son meets the prophet Samuel, the Lord says, bingo, that one. You know, I often imagine in that particular story that God is playing the part of the announcer on The Price is Right. And Samuel is Drew Carey. So the announcer says from the Bob Barker studio in Hollywood, The Price is Right. David, son of Jesse, come on down. David, as the youngest, wouldn't have been considered kingly material. His status in Jesse's family was the lowest. He just got the job of protecting the sheep. But God's gift for even the lowest member of Jesse's family was to lead the kingdom of Israel and Judah, two separate kingdoms that David brought together under his reign. God's measure of success for kingly duties was not meted out to the fanciest and the flashiest and the eldest in the family, because when God measures for success, God uses a different yardstick than we do. When God measures our church for success, he doesn't crunch the numbers so much as he crunches the numbers 
that appear in every human heart turned toward God. Regardless of congregation size, three or three thousand, budget size, clergy leadership, or even the quality of the music program. Does that mean that God isn't interested in what our church is doing? No, but I think God is far more interested in how the hearts of God's people are turned toward heaven. You might feel like you're not worthy of a gift from God. David was considered not worthy of the gift, and so they left him out in the field with the sheep, which actually makes David out to be a New Zealander, not an Israelite. <laughs> Around us in our lives, we will face kingdoms that will fail and fall. Kingdoms of greed, kingdoms of power, kingdoms of politics. We as people will face trial and hardship, persecution and famine, lean years and even leaner bank accounts. But, says Jesus, in the midst of all that, take heart, for I have come to overcome this world. The measure God uses to measure us is not a measure of how faithful or pious we are, who we might vote for or what bandwagon cause, cause that we jumped upon this week, but rather how malleable, humble and open our hearts are. We even kind of repeat that phrase in the slogan of the United Methodist Church. We're called to be, but we're not quite yet because we're always a work in progress. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. But I think God actually pours good gifts on those whose hearts are shut off from God. Just as much as God pours good gifts on those whose hearts are open. The difference is for those that have opened their hearts to the kingdom of God and God's spirit. They find that God's good gifts fall into good soil. They find that grace grows like a tree. And as Psalm 1 says, a tree that bears fruit at the right time, whose leaves do not dry up. You see, most of the time, the answer to our problems in life is not more money in the bank. It's not the house paid off. It's not our relationships being a okay with our family and others. Most of the time, actually, I would suggest all of the time, God's good gifts to us, described metaphorically as bread and fish, God's good gifts to us nourishes us deep in our lives, giving us confidence to walk ahead with our heads held high, knowing that we are a citizen of the kingdom of God, a son and a daughter of the Most High God, resting in God's goodness even when the world around us goes to H-E double hockey sticks in a handbasket. You see, when we look back over our lives, we find times that we feel like things have just gone wrong. But you know we're in good company. Because Noah was drunk. Abraham was too old. Man, do you know how old that guy was when Isaac was born? Isaac, the son, was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Yet we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Jacob's a liar. Leah was ugly. Moses was abused. Sorry, Joseph was abused. Moses, however, stuttered. He couldn't string two sentences together. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab, well, she was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were both thought to be too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaac preached naked. I'm not going to do that, just in case you're wondering. That is a side you don't want to see. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist ate grasshoppers. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while they were praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman at the world was divorced and divorced and divorced and divorced and divorced. And the fellow that she was living with right now wasn't even married to. Paul was too religious. Did you know that Timothy had an ulcer? Lazarus, Paul Lazarus, Lazarus was dead. Every one of these Bible characters could have blamed God for all the bad things that had happened to them. And you know, sometimes some of them did. But every one of them discovered that God's gifts for them were bread and fish, not stones and snakes. 
the great, great theologian, one of the greatest theologians the world has ever seen, the great Reverend Dr. Forrest Gump, once said, stuff happens. Actually, that's not what he said. He said something else, but I'll let your imagination run wild. But even though stuff happens, even in the valley of the shadow of death, even when it feels like God is punishing us for our sins and our failures, the truth is God is standing by raining good gifts on his children. Gifts that far outlast a paid off credit card, a burned mortgage or a healthy bank balance. Good gifts that are sent to help us stand up tall and straight in the strength of God. Paul writes to the Roman community in the fifth chapter these words. Throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come, writes Paul. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, says Paul, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. And this bit I love the most in this scripture. We can't round up containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. You see, when God gives us good gifts, He doesn't send us snakes and stones and natural disasters and tribulation and financial hardship and terror or a dead car battery on the morning we least need it. God sends us good gifts, especially the gift of hope that we experience in and through God's Holy Spirit. And not just hope, so much hope, so much joy, so much love, so much peace, so much good, so much grace. That as Paul writes, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything that God generously pours into our lives through God's Holy Spirit. You know, oftentimes at funerals, we've been known to say that God took this person too soon. Or that God needed another little angel. Or that God looked down from heaven and picked a flower in the garden for his garden. These kinds of statements, when you follow them through to their conclusion, come from the pits of hell. They are bad gifts. The bad gifts that keep us, as the children of God, on a downward spiral to depression and misery. And God is not the author of misery or depression. God is not the author of destruction or devastation. God in Jesus, writes the Gospel writer John, comes to bring us life and life more abundantly. So do we experience a bad gift from God when we find ourselves walking in the valley of the shadow of death? When we find ourselves at the front of a church or in a funeral home, standing next to the body of our loved one? Is that a bad gift from God? No. No. A thousand times no. God's gift to us is not death and destruction. God's gift to us in the dark places we find ourselves in. When we experience the loss of someone or the loss of anything, the loss of a job, the loss of a dream, God gives to us in the dark places the gift of God's presence. The promise that though we shall walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the gift of God in that dark place is the very presence of God that provides strength for the journey, food for our aching tummies, and light unto our feet. You know, I can look back in my life and say, my child died. God acted up that day. How dare you, God? Except God didn't offer that death. God's gift in the middle of pain and brokenness was the presence that God gave me and walked with me in through the valley of the shadow of death. You've heard me say it before, so let me say it again. Death and misery and heartache and pain are lies that are fed to you from the pits of hell. The gift of God to us is Christ Jesus. The one who brought life, love, hope, forgiveness, grace, mercy, and peace, and who promised to never abandon us 
as we walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Even on those days where, let's be honest, hope seems hard to find. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Hear these words, church. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. <clears throat> do you need a good gift today? Do you need to hear from God today? Well, Scripture tells us to ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. For anyone who asks will receive. And anyone who seeks will find. And the door will be open to those who knock. Now, we don't ask God in order to convince God to give us good gifts. We ask so we can find our hearts in a place that are open to the good gifts that God is already pouring out on us, even in this very moment. Now, if you ask for your life to be filled by God's grace this day, I can assure you 155% that if your heart is turned towards God, your life will feel filled with grace. God's response is not to fill you up with misery and pain and death and destruction and devastation, but to open your eyes and your ears and your nose and your mouth and to tingle your taste buds, all of your senses, to the blessings that God is pouring out on you. And God's blessings are not stones, nor are they snakes. They are bread and fish food and sustenance for the journey. Not heartache and pain, but grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and peace like a river where we can say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet and trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Sing with me. He Like I always was Learning to be loved by you